this young man has been, um, I, don't, I don't claim any sons in the gospel. I claim, I got birth sons, you know. And, uh, but this one is as close to a son as there's going to be. Because this young man, when I met him, gosh, 2011, I think. 2010, 2011, he was still in the service of our country as a, a GI, you know, in uh, serving overseas in a hot zone. And, but he was serving, doing some things for the kingdom, which was interesting when I, when I met him. And, and uh, since I've come to know he and his mom, and uh, yeah, there's mama. She was up here shaking her tambourine, too. <laughs> and, uh, but um, one of the things I found out about him, number one, he's passionate. Number two, he's armed. Um, number three, <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but don't, let that, don't let that intimidate you because his heart is fully co com com uh, committed to the Lord. And uh, so I, I knew I was going to do this. And, and there were several people that got ordained into the, into the full-time ministry, as it were, uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. And uh, with this young man, though, um, he's the youngest of that group. But with this young man in particular, one of the things that stands out to me is that he is a soldier. Oh yeah. You know, they told me a few weeks ago that I shouldn't be so militaristic. You know, when you spend 10 years in the military, it's kind of hard. 10 formative years, it's kind of hard to let that go. But I have promoted him as the Lord has allowed me to promote him. So when I, when I first started hanging out with him, I'd call him private, you know. Um, so private, you know, pull rank on him. Still pulling rank on him, but, you know, anyway. <laughs> Then I called him Sarge. I'd say, what's up, Sarge? You know, and he called me Sarge. But, but now I, I call him, he's a, he's a full lieutenant in the army of the Lord, uh, a, a rising officer, as it were. And, and he's ready to minister to you out of his heart. Would you welcome and accept, for those of you that have not met him, this is Kyle Fisher. Would you welcome Kyle Fisher by standing on your feet? Amen. Good evening, everybody. Hello, my name is... Evening. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Kyle Fisher, and um, I got to do this. With your permission, sir, permission to carry on. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I did that at the leading of the Lord. Why? That man is my general. That man is my spiritual father. That man is the shepherd of this house, and I will respect the authority, especially when he has given this pulpit over to me. I did it in a military manner as one does it to another military man. So I did it in the only way that I knew how to respect him. Like I said, he is the shepherd of this house. He is the commander of this post. And as a person who is under his authority, I will respect that authority the best way I know how. So, all right, but I, I would love for you all to bow your heads, lift your hands up, do whatever you feel, and let's pray real quick. Abba, Father, God on high, the King of kings and Lord of lords, we come before you with open hearts. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. Right now, we ask that you open our minds, you open our hearts we yield our spirits to you so that we may receive this word. Lord, I yield myself to you. I give you the reins. You have full control. May I convey what you wish me to convey. Bless each and every one of us this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, I'm going to explain just a wee bit about myself because I believe you all need a little bit of a context before I get in here. Pastor Tommy was so gracious to us. Yes, I am a military man. I spent four years active duty army with one year of tour duty in Afghanistan. I am also a cowboy, full-fledged, and a mountain man. So my terminology is going to be a little bit weird when it comes to certain things. So just so you all get the pretext to this. I want you to know, too, that whatever I say, I say in love. It may come out harsh, but it comes out out of love. For if we do, as the Apostle Paul writes in... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if I speak with eloquence and that of the angels but have not love, it is nothing more than the, the sounding of metal clinging together. Right. All right, y'all, let's get into this. So, um, I am a very much a, I, I love what you were talking about today, Pastor Tommy, that fits perfectly with what I'm going on. And that last song, Kathy, I swear, I love it when God does this because he puts everything together. I am a military man. I love spiritual warfare. That is my forte, is spiritual warfare and the wildness of God. What I want to talk to you right now is, mit, is rest in the midst of battle. But these are the time of refreshings. And when Pastor Tommy had asked me, uh, when he had approached me to give the message, it was for February, but that got passed back, thank God, to be honest with you. Because he gave me a little bit of time to, to think on things as I was going through, through things, going through my own battles. And so I was thinking to myself, all right, God, 
I got a feeling you don't want me to do spiritual warfare like you would normally do or your wildness. What is this? There's something here. He's like, what's the name of this place? What's the name of this? Time of refreshing. He goes, yeah. What is it that I've been trying to get through that thick skull of yours, my son? Rest. Like, gotcha. Yes, sir. So, the time, this time of refreshing is an amazing thing that we have. It's a great, because it allows us um, to regroup, to, to recuperate, to get in these things and to come together, not just on a normal Sunday like we do, but also to come together. I, I see this as a way of coming together, almost like the Wednesday night services we used to have in Tiffin. It come, we come together in a more collective way, um, in a more relaxed way, where we're more ourselves instead of that... Um, I don't want to say image because I know most of the people in here, but that, that way we have to present ourselves when we walk through the doors of a church. And here it's a little bit more relaxed. By the way, I got to give this disclaimer. Pastor Tommy always says about religious toes, you might as well put them away with me because I won't stomp on them. I will smash them with a hammer. <laughs> I will smash them. And the only thing that yielding me a little bit is because we got the kiddos in here. So that's a good thing. So I would love for y'all, if you could please, turn to, and most of y'all know this, is Matthew 11, verse 28. Now, I'm going to be reading from the Amplified. That's my preferred version. You've got yours. That's great. Don't yell at me for not using King James. So, come to me, all who are weary with heavenly burdened by religious rituals that provide no peace, and I will give you rest, refreshing your souls with salvation. So the first thing is, is we, before we begin to rest, we got to understand what is it exactly we're resting from. Like I said, I'm glad she did this thing on war because guess what we're resting from? War. How many in here do not know that we are in a spiritual war? No condemnation, no shame. I don't do that up here. If, if you don't know that we're in a spiritual war that manifests in the physical, emotional, psychological, any realm, wake up. Seriously, wake up. Because the moment you become a believer, you're in a war. Period, end of sentence. You don't have a choice. So I'm, since I didn't see any hands go up or anything, I'm assuming that we all know that we're in a spiritual war. Fantastic. We all, every one of us face a daily battle. Every single one of us. Whether it's in the, it, it starts in the spiritual realm. And the, and the deeper and deeper we get in our faith, the deeper and deeper we, we receive the revelations from God. We, we come together with the collective body. We start seeing it. At first, it may start small. Or, if, depending on the person, it will hit you like a freight train. That's just one part. That's the spiritual battle, which I can get into a whole other thing. Emotional. Me, my thing with emotion was anger. I remember back when I uh, got out of the army, I was speaking with Pastor Tommy. He's the only one I really trusted back then to speak with certain things about this. It was anger for me, especially when I came back from Afghanistan, especially when I came back from that sandbox because I was over there with a mission I didn't even know what we were doing over there, and not to mention some of the things that had happened to me over there. Physical, hoy. Cars that just love to slip and slide on ice. <laughs> Don't believe me? Look at my car out there. It's the Ford Fusion without the front bumper. <laughs> Aches and pains just coming out of nowhere all of a sudden. I woke up one morning. I had a crick in my neck. I couldn't even turn my head, which I needed to do for work. It was horrible. Just the stupid little things that happened to us. But they can manifest into the biggest things. And then as, um, as all those who love on the... Uh, Armed Forces Network loves to say the unseen battle, mental issues. Now, I'm not up here talking about bipolar or anything like that. I'm talking about those little thoughts in the back of your head that you just didn't know how those came up. You know, you, or, or all of a sudden, those old things that by the grace of God and his deliverance, you had put away, you had casted around, but delivered from, all of a sudden come lurking back your back door. And there's also other major battles. Divorce, death, fighting for a child. I can tell you right now on divorce right here. You want to know that story? Come see me sometime. You want to know about the grace and the power of God? I'm not saying that to promote myself, but I will tell you this right now. After that experience, I will, I will bet my life that there's a God. And I'll bet my life on the fact that, that he can pull you through anything. Because I tell you what, there was a couple times I almost put a 45 caliber bullet in my head. 
You want to talk about warfare, there you go. So, but by the grace of God. Grace of God. So, now, be, now that we've identified these battles, it's the battle to maintain. We have to maintain our front, is what it's called. The front is, you know, the front lines. The amount of territory or ground you've gained in warfare. The front. Your faith. Ho, ho, ho. That's a sermon in and of itself. Try writing on that bull. Oh, my Lord. Maintaining your faith. But it's the most important. The most important fight we face is, is maintaining our faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. I, I, I seriously, you can do a, you do a whole study on faith. You will see why the enemy tries so much to destroy our faith. So we have to fight every day to maintain it. I remember I was listening. Um, I was listening to Perry Stone the other day, and uh, it prompted me to do a fast actually um, on unbelief. And he goes uh, talking about um, the, the disciples that could not cast out this one demon. And so he was he was talking about it. He goes. It was because, oh, ye of little faith, where, where, where's your faith? And Jesus, of course, rebuked the demon, and it, and it was casted out. And he goes, this kind of, uh, this kind can only be, um, can only be taken care of by fasting and prayer. And so he was talking about how it applied to unbelief, not the demon, but the unbelief in the disciples. So I'm like, all right, Lord, there's some stuff that's going on. I'm not making a breakthrough. What's going on? So I fasted for as long as he told me to. That's the stuff we got to do to maintain the front. Is that faith? By the way, I'm like Pastor Tommy. I'm completely transparent. I don't care. I have no shame. I, you judge me all up and down. I don't care. I got no problem riding this bronc. All right, finances is another one. Finances. Do I really need to say more on that one? Seriously, how much we battle on finances? The God of this world, yes, it is Satan himself, but he's got his second in command, which I truly believe is Mammon, the God of money. How everything is driven by money and maintaining our finances because he knows the one thing we believers. I mean, honestly, God made manna rain down from heaven and provided quails. He can make, make money apparent. He's done it to me before. So we got to maintain our finances properly. And I pray to God, those of you who've been here have been listening to what Pastor Steve and especially what Pastor Lynette and Pastor Tommy have been driven in about tithing. It, it works. And I'm not going to go into that. That's... I'm not getting into that. I'm not riding that style. Anyway, finances is so important, though. We allow it. We just allow it to come, people to come in because we think it's worldly. No, no. If you do some research on Jesus, he was a very wealthy minister. So wealthy, in fact, that he had to have a, uh, he had to have a treasurer, which was Judas Iscariot. And that Judas Iscariot stole a lot of money from it, and yet it did not even make a dent in the ministry. So it, maintaining our finances is so important because it is a tool to use, and it's a battle. Trying to figure out what bills, I mean, how you're going to pay your bills or doing those things, especially if you're not led by the Spirit. If you're not led by the Spirit when it comes to finances, get a revelation, please. F please. <laughs> because there is only one way you're going to get, be able to maintain your finances, especially in this world with gas prices fluctuating, the way the stock market is, and all sorts of stuff that's been going on. Another thing is, relationships, especially marriage. You would be amazed at the word God gave me on marriage when I was driving around in a Kia Soul. Relationships are so hard to maintain nowadays. The divorce rate is, is over 50% in the United States, 60% in the church. And that's from about four or five years back, that statistic. Friendships, when everything is so fickle, we throw away relationships and marriage like we throw away cars, like we throw away trash. Maintaining those relationships, especially Mike and Mary Lou, Pastor Tommy Lynette. I mean, you guys have been married over 50 years, correct? Over 50? 53 years. That is a miracle in and of itself. Right there. Anybody who has been married over five years, honestly, in this country anymore, God bless you. That is a fight in and of itself to maintain relationships. I mean, I am a result on the bad end of that, having, a, having had a divorce, fighting as hard as I can, maintaining it. And the last one, my favorite, is our sanity. You know how many times I wanted to light a match, just watch the world burn? <laughs> I'm being honest, 
honest though. I'm being transparent up here. I'm serious. Just with everything that goes on. I don't care what side of the aisle are on. I don't care if you're conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican. I don't care. This world's going nuts. It is. But thank God that we have the Lord who gave us enough foresight with the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and other prophecies so we can be better prepared for it. But maintaining our sanity when you got people. I have college students flipping me off for no reason. Like, come on. Why is the aggression? And I carry when I'm at work. I ain't stupid. I've heard the stories. Yes, I believe in the full protection of God, but he was also smart enough to say, hey, give yourself a sword and be smart about it. And this gets me to my one thing, and I'm focusing on this point, and I want to preface it with saying this, the toll of battle. PTSD. Now, I want you to go with me on this one here. I need you to pay real close attention to track. For the record, I want to say I am sick. I am, forgive me on my word, I caught it. I am fed up with seeing movies about PTSD, especially with soldiers, because it makes you think that every single one of us got it. Um, that's all I'm going to say on that. Not every single one of us that has stepped foot on a battlefield has PTSD and you stop treating us like we do. And those of you, my brothers and sisters out there watching, there's a way to overcome it. I know because I did. And it's only through the blood and the power of Jesus Christ. No medicine, no, no wizard, and that's a military term, so I'm going to go over your heads. No wizard and no candy shop is going to be able to get you through it but the blood of the lamb. I, I did a little research, and I actually looked up the VA's website, and they had a, a thing on the history of PTSD, and I remember hearing it back when I was um, in the military, when I was going through out transiting, especially when I, when I came back from Afghanistan, they did a screening of us for those of us who had PTSD, for, to see if we had PTSD. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, those who have suffered such a traumatic event or series of events to where it messes with your mind. You're hypervigilant. You're on edge all the time. You don't, I mean, it, it controls your life. Some of it is very... It's not that severe. You just go around about your normal day and you, just, you notice the little ticks, but it ain't too bad to where it's full blown. You wake up from a dream, you better pray your spouse or whoever you're sleeping next to don't have a 45 under that pillow because there have been stories of that. Woken up having full blown flashbacks to Vietnam or Afghanistan. And I'm gonna say this, I truly believe there is a special kind of PTSD for soldiers and for police officers that is different from everybody else, whether it's rape victims or anything in the lines, I truly believe because of combat, because the way combat is, because the way life, def life and death situations are. Back in World War II, they used to call it battle fatigue or combat stress reaction. Now, I'm going to read you a quote from the VA. In World War II, the shell shock di diagnosis, which was the term for it in World War I, was replaced with combat stress reaction, CSR, or known as battle fatigue, with long surges common in World War I, at World War II, soldiers became battle-weary and exhausted. Now, long surges, what that means is back in World War II, you're, you were years out on the battlefield. We're talking two, three, four years out on battle, unless somehow you got called back. Now, with the way things were with the Iraq and Afghan wars, um, the most was 24 months. That didn't last long, and then it was repealed to 18, then 15, then a year, and then nine months and six months. The average you would see now is about... I was the last, my unit was one of the last of the full year deployers before the drawdown, and then everything ramped back up. Now, if you had anything longer than a nine month deployment, you had something called R&R, &R, which was two weeks, you got to go anywhere in the world, military paid for it. As long as there was an airstrip they could drop you off at. Um, but they did, they paid for it. So look at that. Now, think about that as a believer. Now, I, I gave you all that to put in perspective. I want, I want you to understand that perspective, an actual real-world understanding of it. I know that we've had several in here that have served in the military, and for that, I thank you all for your service. God bless you all. And for the families that stuck with them. Now, it's, now to the spiritual side. We don't get... Now, with a deployment, it's a rotation, you get to come back off the battlefield. Me, I only deployed once. I was only in for four years. I only deployed once. I know guys, I know my chaplain, my first chaplain couldn't deploy with us because he deployed too many times within his time span. I know, go figure, right? Great man. Great man of God. We don't get to come back from the front lines. We don't. Ever, the moment we say, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior, we are on the front lines. 
We are trained on the front lines. That's how it is. It is, it is baptism by fire in a sense. Now, yes, we, we are blessed with wise um, teachers and sages, our pastors, our other teachers and evangelists. We're also blessed with the experience of those soldiers and warriors that have gone before us. And not to mention the greatest teacher of all, the Holy Ghost. That's right. That's right. Well, yeah. Amen. But it's all on the battlefield. That's it. There, there is no coming back home for a year. There is no coming back from it. You're out there on the front lines, period, 24-7, 365, until the day you're either raptured or you're dead. That's it. Now, up, now, up to a half of World War II military discharges were said to be the result of combat exhaustion. We have a word for that. We like to call it apostasy. Those Christians who do not want to be a Christian anymore, they decide to leave the battlefield. We don't get that choice, those of us who are, who are truly called to be disciples, men and women of God. We don't get that choice unless we say, nope, I'm done. And you walk away and you deny the faith. There's a song by Manifest. He's a Christian rapper. It's called No Plan B. I really enjoy that song. Yes, I listen to Christian rap, by the way. No Plan B. We don't get Plan B in this line of work. I don't care if you're a pastor, teacher, evangelist, missionary. I don't care if you're fivefold or not. You don't get a Plan B. That's it. You're on the front lines. There, there is... No end to the combat. I want to read a verse. It's Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. If you guys will give me a second. How y'all doing tonight? Man, weren't the, that praise and worship great? Man, that was great. Especially the little ones. I love the little ones. All right. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 goes as follows. Fear nothing that you are about to suffer and be aware that the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested in your faith. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful to the point of death, even if you must die for your faith. And I will give you the crown consisting of life. Our only way out of here is death or rapture. Period. That's it. That's the only way we get to go home. And then we get to come back to reign again and enforce the authority, which gets into a completely different study of the book of Revelation. Now, so that is what we're dealing with here. Full on battle each and every day. Attacking not just one, but all fronts if possible. At least, I would say at least two to three fronts. At least. And we wonder why so many Christians are leaving the faith. We wonder why because we are just weary and beaten down. Why? Because, and this was on me. So I'm coming from a place of unfortunate experience. We forgot how to rest. We forgot how to refresh ourselves. That's what was nice about R&R, &R, those two weeks I came home. I was honestly going to go home to Alaska for a couple weeks and go to the festival up in uh, Talkeetna there in June. Exactly, the Moose Dropping Festival, <laughs> which if you want to know about that later, I can tell you. But I needed to come home to see my family. I need to be rested up for a little bit. And having been the type of soldier that I am. Now, I was a chaplain's assistant. I wasn't infantry. I wasn't combat arms. I was a chaplain's assistant. I was a bodyguard, secretary, altar boy, all in one. That's where I was. So, I mean, I really uh, didn't get to see battle that much. Some things happened in Afghanistan. A couple of them were a little funny, actually. But, I mean, I am not like some of the guys that have been out there. So I'm not up here trying to take any claim or fame to that. But spiritually, oh, those of us who have been fighting on the front lines, those of us who have been going against the, the forces of darkness, we have forgotten, I, I believe, a majority of us, especially those of us who were once gun ho at time, have forgotten how to rest. Now, all of you, please turn to Hebrews chapter 4. There it is. Yeah, I knew I put my bookmark right there for a reason. All right, in my Bible, let, can I get an amen when you all have it? 
Chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to start at verse 1. So chapter 4, verse 1. Alrighty. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still remains and is freely offered today, let us fear in, any ca- in case any one of you may seem to come short of reaching it or think he has come too late. I'm going to be reading through verse 11, so bear with me, y'all. For indeed we have had the good news of salvation preached to us just as the Israelites also when the, God, the, the good news of the promised land came to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because it was not united with faith in God by those who heard. Pause. Thank you. I needed a slurp. Um, for, for we who believe, that is who we, pers- who we pay close attention to these, these verses right here. For we who believe, that is who we personally trust and confidently rely on God, notice the word trust, Enter that rest so that we have inner peace now because we are, are confident in our salvation and assured of his power, just as he uh, has said, as I swore an oath in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This he said, although his works were completed from the foundation of the world, waiting for all uh, who would believe, for somewhere in, in scriptures, he has said about the seventh day, God rested on the seventh day from all of his works, and again, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since the promise remains for some to enter his rest, and those who formerly had the good news preached to them failed to grasp it and did not enter because of their unbelief and evidence by disobedience. Focus on that verse too. He said, he again set a definitive day, a new today, providing another opportunity to enter the rest by saying uh, through David after so long a time, just as he had said before in the words already quoted, today if if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. This mention of a rest was not a reference to the entering into Canaan. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak of another day of opportunity after that. So there remains a full, complete Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has once entered his rest also rested from the weariness and pain of his human labors. Notice that too, just as God rested from those labors, uniquely his own. Let us therefore make an, a, a, every effort to enter into the rest of God, to know and experience it for ourselves so that no one may fall by following the same example of disobedience as those who died in the wilderness. So, I know that was a long passage. There's a lot in there. Part of what I wanted you to focus on was the, was the obedience part, the trust. What is rest? Stepping back and allowing God to take over full time. There are times we have to step back, give the reins over to him. I'm like, all right, y'all, all right, Lord, you got this one. I'm going to be over here for a bit. We have to. We're not God. We're not. Now, yes, we draw from his strength. We draw from his power, his grace. We draw from everything. His spirit is inside us. Christ is in us and we in him. But, but, we're still not him. We cannot keep battling over and over again without resting. That's why we were commanded to rest. If you look at the Old Testament, if you actually do a study on the Old Testament festivals and you look how much time God gave gave them off from working and laboring, you wonder how they got any work done. Seriously, especially during a jubilee year and everything like that. Oh, man, full years without working. Full years without working. And then not to mention all the other perks, especially if you got married. That first year, you didn't do anything. You were with your spouse. That's where I'm going to leave it. Um, You know? So entering into God's rest, it's, it's letting him take over. Letting him take over the fight for a little while. While you recuperate, while you heal up, while you rest up. I do spiritual warfare ministry. That is my ministry, and I love it with a passion. Man, I remember back in the days when I would get so enthralled with it. Mistake number one. It was a mistake number one because I would just push myself to the edge until I collapsed and broke and or break down. The 
There were times I wasn't necessarily pleasant to be around during those times, and the Lord has corrected me on that. It's taking a break. Whether it's taking a break from your ministry for a little bit, if the Lord sanctions it. Sometimes it's taking a step back. I mean, if you're a missionary out there in India or the Philippines or even here in the States, sometimes it's like taking a few months off, recuperating, resting, instead of being on the go all the time. Sometimes it's not always listening to that favorite preacher or teacher. Now, I'm not saying don't go to church. I'm not saying don't listen to your pastor. But I listen to other uh, teachers and, and, and outside of Pastor Tommy. I do. And sometimes I just got to step back, take a break from them, and relax and listen to some different teaching. It's also important. It's, uh, let me say this too. It's also very important to be well-rounded in the people you listen to. Listen to your pastor first and foremost because God directed you here for a reason. But the second thing is, is for those other teachers, have a, have a nice little balance. Because if you're just invested so much in one subject, you're going to miss something else. You're going to miss how to get to that, like prosperity. You listen to nothing about prosperity, you're going to miss faith. Now, I'm not saying that the prosperity teachers don't teach faith. What I'm saying is there's much more in depth. And you need to be well-rounded in your faith. You know? It's just like when you go to school. You go to school, you get your general educations, your gen eds done, and then you focus on your field. We need to focus on all the general education that God's given us, especially within the apologetics or anything else, and then focus in our field. Because that keeps us balanced. I mean, it, it, you could almost apply the principle of the body of Christ. The eye cannot say to the ear, I wish I was an ear. Right. It's got to be well-rounded within all of us. Amen. Another thing, too. Take a break. Go on a vacation every once in a while. It's okay. Amen. Go on a vacation. Amen. Me, what I used to do is I usually <laughs> take a vacation even if it's sitting on your couch and vegging out on Netflix, that's right, I said it, because I'd veg the Punisher. I said it. But, but no, take a vacation. Me, I used to go down to Texas. I would go down to Texas to see my buddy, Bryce Bell, one of my oldest Army buddies, go fight MMA. And that was a vacation for me. Go down, see him, see his family. They are, pretty, they are my Texas family, period, in a sentence. I am welcome there anytime, and I love them. They are fantastic, great people. They are my Texas family. They're great. I go down and watch them fight. He's still trying to rope me in to fight for him, which may happen, but... So, but, I mean, it's relaxing. Going on a trip, even if it's... Maybe it's for an hour. Maybe it's for a week. Just something to... Just something to get your mind off of it. Now, trust equals rest. You trust in God, you're resting. You fully trust in God, you're fully resting. We must trust in God because that, at that moment you're like, all right, I don't have to worry about my finances. I don't have to worry about my relationship. I don't have to worry about my ministry. God, you got this. I'm going to remove the foot from my mouth, remove my head from the fifth point of contact, and I'm going to step back and let you take over. Why? Because it ain't about me. It's about you. It's about you. It ain't about me. And sometimes we, we, we forget that and we make it about ourselves. I know, been there, done that, got the T-shirt, autographed even. But I've done that, but I've done it because I became so engrossed. And we, sometimes we're just like, I want to do this for the kingdom. I want to do this for the kingdom. I'm so kingdom driven. But then you realize you're putting the cart before the horse. You're taking over the reins on that horse and not God. Now, yes, there are times where we are to walk alongside God. But that don't mean you ever get to walk in front of him. Your horse starts getting a little bit in front of his down the trail. You rein that horse back and you make sure that it's in line with him. Trusting in God also means being obedient to God because he is not going to give you rest if you ain't obedient. I will tell you that much right now. Because he is going to kick you wherever he's got to kick you until you, are, until you realize it's about time that I step back and figure out what's been going on, get that fixed in my life, and then enter into his trust. Because how can you be, how can you be obedient to somebody you don't trust? You cannot be obedient to somebody you do not trust. You try it, you're going to fail. You, you won't. You cannot serve two masters. Pain shared equal, uh, equals pain divided. Joy shared equals joy multiplied. This is a book called On Combat. It's by Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. He is the psychology professor at West Point Academy, the United States Army Academy. 
in West Point, New York. He is the by far expert on combat psychology. Pain divided. Well, it's pain shared equals pain divided. Joy shared equals joy multiplied. Pain shared is pain divided and joy shared is joy multiplied. That is the essence of the human condition. Historically, we have always gathered together after a tragic event to divide each other's pain and multiply our joy. We do this in wakes and in funerals and we have always done it after battles to lift up, multiply, and amplify the valor, the sacrifice, and the professionalism of the living and the dead. Do not despise the, the coming together of the congregation. Forgive me if I'm misquoting it. Don't despise it. We need each other. I mean, even in 1 Corinthians, I believe it says, if one mourns, we all mourn. If one laughs, we all laugh. Getting debriefed. This is so important. This is so important. This is why we come to church. This is one of the reasons why we come to church is to get debriefed. This is a debriefing. A sermon is a debriefing. It is receiving from God, whether it's your restoration. Psalms 23, 3. He restores my soul and leads me down the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We need to have that restoration in our lives to restore, to refresh, to make new or to make better, to improve. Otherwise, you try driving in a car that's got a broken axle on it and see how far you get. Peace. Peace. We receive peace when we get the debriefing because we know we're not alone. Because we know that there's something out there that can help us, that can get us through it, even conquer it. For we are more than conquerors. Amen. Psalm 55, 18 talks about it. Yeah. Being filled up. We get filled up when we, come, when, we, when we get debriefed, when we come to the meeting place of fellow believers. Whether it's through praise and worship, whether it's through the sermon or whether it's just talking to your buddy that you haven't seen all week. Just something about coming together with fellow believers, even if nothing is said, it's just like, thank God there are others like me. And that's refreshing. That's building up. That's being filled up. Because if you know there's somebody out there, out there, guess what? Because one of the biggest mistakes a soldier makes, they think they're fighting it alone when you're not. That's what the congregation is for, is to make sure that we know we are not fighting alone. That, that the person on our right and our left is our battle buddy and they've got our back. They've got our six. And that is one of the most important things, if not the most important thing to know on a battlefield is who's, got your, who's on your right and who's on your left. Who's got you? Because if not, you're dead. You're dead. Protection, Psalm 91.1. I'm going to read this one because this is actually one of my favorites. This is my favorite psalm, period. Um... Oh, I used to know it too, but now I need my Bible. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will remain secure and rest in the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no enemy can withstand. That means, guess what? We are protected. That means no flaming arrow of the evil one, no attack of any fallen angel or demon, or any physical thing can attack us. If, as long as we are in, it's, and if we're resting in God, that means we're being obedient, and that means we're trusting in Him. So guess what? We are under the full protection of God, and nothing on earth or from the depths of hell itself can touch us. Do we not? And an important thing about rest too is that we need to understand the full power we walk in, the full authority we walk in, not just the prosperity. All of that is good, and I believe in that. It is the power we walk in, because you can. I, literally, I have seen it happen where you can say to something, get out of my way now. And it moves. And it's not even saying in the name of Jesus. It's not even saying that. Now, if, you want, if you're led to say that, then say it. But when you just come up to say it without even saying that because you're walking in Christ, you look like Christ, when those demons look at you and say, that is Christ, and it's actually you standing there because we reflect the image of Christ, guess what? You don't even need to say in the name of Jesus. You say, move, and it's done. Period. That's walking in authority and faith. Another thing is revelation. Revelation is so important on a debriefing. So important with rest. Because why? It tells us how to do better. And it tells us a new advantage of doing it. This is also from the same book. The first thing all warriors must understand in their, is their moral obligation to participate in a critical incident debriefing. We know that 
Um, unmanned stress is a major factor that can destroy our warriors and devastate their families. It has uh, been mentioned before that PTSD is the gift that keeps on giving, quote unquote. Uh, when you are impacted by stress symptoms, your spouse, your kids are also impacted, uh, uh, is also impacted, and if it is left unchecked, all of you will continue to be affected in the years to come. One key tool to prevent PTSD is the critical incident debriefing. Let me break that down to you, translate from military to civilian. <laughs> that means coming to the services and receiving revelation, letting you know, hey, where did I screw up? Or what actually happened? We go through so many things in life that we don't even know what actually happened. We think we may know, but we're only seeing it through one perspective. But we get that Holy Spirit revelation, we see the whole picture. So that means we know how to assess it better. You get a person who hasn't been properly, doesn't have the proper revelations in their life, and you mix them in into a family, uh, hold on for that rodeo. You better hold, you better cinch that hand in tight, scoot up, and ready to go. I'm serious because that's going to be a fun ride if you, if you, if you or your, your spouse or your children don't have that revelation because they are only then leaning on their own understanding and not God's. And one thing, oh, is God fights our battles. Second, um, Psalm 24, 8 talks about it, but I really like what Second Chronicles says. So Second Chron uh, Chronicles 20, 15. You're lucky, Pastor Lynette. Normally I have more Bible verses, but I decided to skim it back a little bit on this one. <laughs> I gotta tell you, okay, so, every, so uh, when I gave my first message at LifePoint, she was like, you used a lot of verses. Next time you might want to have a couple more pictures up there. Then, and I used so many verses. I mean, that came from Pastor Lynette, so I must have been doing something right. <laughs> Love you, Pastor Lynette. <laughs> he said, listen carefully, all of, all, of you, all of you people of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, the Lord says to you, be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. How many times do we try to pick up a sword that is only meant to be wielded by God and fight a battle that we cannot possibly win because we think we can do it and not let God do it? Amen. God said he will fight. Yes. For the Lord our God is a mighty warrior, Exodus 15, 3. You look about uh, some of the passages that God talks about on war, they ain't just talking about us, they're also talking about him. He is a war God. And it's a great thing because thank God because that means he can fight these battles. When I was going through my divorce with my ex-wife, especially in that first year and a half, by the way, if all, any of you were there while well, that happened, I am so sorry. I was not the most pleasant person back then, so I apologize. Thank you. <laughs> I had no choice but to let God fight that fight for me. Otherwise, I would not be up here talking to you today. I'm, and I'm being honest. I am not exaggerating. I am being honest. If I, would, if I had not let God, if I did not step back, receive the revelation, receive the debriefing, and actually learn to rest in God and be obedient to him, I would not be up here because I allowed God to fight it for me because there is no chance I could have fought it. With some of the things that happened in that whole thing, you cannot tell me there was, that God was not in, involved. You can't. I will call you a liar straight to your face. All right. I, I won't. I won't, sir. Finding the balance. Now, once we've received our rest, and even while we're resting, we got to maintain a balance. Balance is so important. Um, this is also from the VA website. Um, CSR um, was, treat, uh, was treated using PI, proximity, uh, immediacy, expectancy principles. Uh, it requires treating casualties without delay, making sure sufferers uh, ex uh, expected complete recovery so that they re could return to combat after rest. The benefits of military unit relationships and support uh, became a focus of both preventing stress and promoting recovery. So while God is fighting for us, we're resting. While God is fighting for us, we are resting, recuperating. Whether it's that's receiving revelation, receiving correction, receiving the healing that we need, it is, we are doing what we need to do. And it is important to take advantage of it. Because guess what? You got to go back out to the front line sometime. So you take advantage of things like this. Times of refreshing. Things like Jerry Savelle coming. Things like conferences going to. Take advantage if you can. 
I tell you what, there are two conferences I'm going to at the, uh, at the end of this month and then one in September. I didn't think I was going to get to. Guess what? God provided a way because I needed to go and bring some people with me. There they are. As they get all red and bashful. Well, she is. She ain't. I know. They'll beat me later. It's all right. So we got to be expected to, come, to go back out. We take advantage of the people we're with. Not taking advantage of them, but taking advantage of the fact that we're in their company and they can help restore. Being around, if you're a man, being around fellow men. Women, same thing, being around fellow women. In faith, you know, it is, it is taking advantage of these opportunities that God has given us so we can heal. Because guess what? We got to go back out in the fight. Ephesians 6, 13. Oh, my favorite passage. The armor of God. I actually have this one memorized, but I'm making sure that I don't mess it up. So give me a sec. Where are you at? There you are. Therefore, put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger and having done everything that the crisis demands, stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious. That means while you're taking your rest, it is making you make sure you're rested and well, well groomed to go back out and fight. Because like I said, this ain't done until Jesus come back. Even the dead in Christ will fight again. Like I said, that goes into a whole thing about Revelation. You got to remember, you and Guy are a team. You are a team. Christ is in you and you are in him. But God is the leader. You are a team. That don't mean you can go out there and fight every fight. That don't mean you can go out there and fight instead of him. And there are times God's going to be like, what are you looking at me for? Get up, grab your sword, let's go. I gave you a sword for a reason. Not a pillow. You want to talk about pillows in the Bible, you look at what Jacob slept on. He slept on a rock for his pillow. Well, he, when he got his revelation from God in his new name. We follow Yeshua's example. Jesus' example. I've been doing a lot of Hebrew studies, so you'll have to excuse me. Jesus at times, Mark 6, uh, 31 through 32, if you want to write that one down, we're not going to go to it, but that's a good example. He even found ways where he had to get away from his disciples, get away from the crowds, and sit and rest. Why? Because of the taxation of the people, of the ministering he's doing, especially when he had to deal with the, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, and he had to deal with the people of unbelief. Oh, talk about a taxi ministry dealing with people of unbelief. Especially if they're the aggressive ones. He is the perfect example of finding balance because he knew when, and you got to figure out when, you got to figure out when to draw away. Right. Now me, I can probably stand out in the battlefield longer than, I don't know, maybe Tristan can, or maybe Leah can, in spiritual warfare. But maybe when it comes to a different type of battle, they can uh, stand out fat longer than I can. It depends. That is something that is between you and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And you let the Holy Ghost determine it. You don't. Right. Trust me, you try to go in too soon, while well, you still got fighting down, you may drop the ball on something. Or you wait too late, you're, you're down on the ground and they're having to carry you away. You got to watch yourself. That means checking in on yourself. Doing those self-checks. Like, all right, am I really okay? And be honest. Don't lie to yourself. You can't lie to the Holy Ghost. He already knows. And if you're lying to yourself, guess what? He's going to tell you one way or another and he ain't going to like it neither. He may be kind and gracious with her and be like, what do you think you're doing? Boom. And trust me, he's done it to me before. I still got the boot mark. We use our faith. We remain obedient. We trust in the Lord. And we rest in him. We follow those things. You get in deeper. And the deeper and deeper you get into rest, the stronger and stronger, the more healed in everything you get. Because if you just take enough to get you by... You're going to miss something. And you are always going to be struggling. You are always going to be living day to day. And it ain't going to be rewarding. And by the time you get up to that judgment throne, you're going to be like, huh? Oh, where were you? I was there, 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 and there. You missed me, not the other way around. So. All right, y'all, that's all I got right now. But 
Am I, am I closing out? Am I closing out? Looks like I'm closing out. I, I got to ask. I don't want to take no show. All right, y'all. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's, um, give me a sec. Yes, one. All right. Let's just open, let's just close our eyes, lift our hands. Yahweh, our Lord, our God, we thank you so much for the amazing praise and worship that you have restored into us. We thank you for this time of refreshing, and we give you thanks that we are, that we are living in a country that we are able to gather like this. Yes. Lord, we leave this place, but not your presence. Continue to teach us, especially me, about your rest. Let us continue to walk and even sleep in the embrace of your arms under the covering of your wings. Guide us, lead us, prick our hearts. May your grace and your mercy comfort us like a warm blanket. And in times, if you need a Spartan kick us to the chest to wake us up, then so do it. So be it. We are at your disposal. You deal with us how you wish. We love you. We enter into you. And we give you praise and thanks in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen.